Hey everyone, this is uh, a really crazy moment here. I'm speaking to an open room, or an empty room, and uh, you know, the, my heart in this is to really hopefully convey the Lord's heart to us in this time, and you know, the thing I want to do first as we are in this crazy, crazy time is I want to open in prayer and ask the Lord to come and anoint this time, just you know, I think all of us just have so many questions and so much concern about where this is going and where this is going to end. As I, I want us to really get into the place of prayer with the Lord. And so just I want to invite you real quick, wherever you are, whether you're listening to it on TV, an iPad, an iPhone, while you're exercising, just pause for a moment and let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to really give us His heart in this matter, okay? So, Lord, we just come right now, and we ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would just quiet our hearts, Lord, Lord, and you would fill our hearts with the answers to the questions we're asking. Lord, I ask you, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be upon this time, Lord. We just want to thank you that you, Jesus, are the peace that we long for. You, Jesus, are the solution, And I just ask you, Lord, to everyone out there that's listening to this, Lord, that we would truly feel you, the peace of God, the Prince of Peace in this time, Lord, that we would truly know what you're speaking and what you're saying. And I ask you, Lord, to anoint this message and give us ears to hear what you are speaking and what you are saying, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to go ahead and start by turning to John chapter 6, and if you're listening there, I would love for you to join me in John chapter 6. I mean, what an incredibly just bizarre, crazy time this is. And, you know, when I walked in, our our Doug, the sound, who's doing the sound for us, asked me, he said, well, I noticed you got a haircut, and so hopefully none of you guys out there whose hair is growing longer are getting jealous, but I did get a haircut. That's one of the advantages of having your sister-in-law live in your neighborhood, and she cuts your hair. So anyway, just, uh, it is crazy though, isn't it? I mean, you know, thinking about how you're going to get gas, and you know, you got to figure out a strategy. I mean, me and my wife spent, I don't know, a couple minutes before I left talking about the strategy I needed to use to get gas and check the P.O. box. I mean, it's just a really crazy time, and You know, everyone's asking questions, and everyone's giving their perspective, and everyone's offering their opinion, and all this. I mean, I'm sure you you've seen it out there. You know, I you know you've seen so many different things. You know, some are saying this virus is worse is no worse than the flu, and others saying, and you know, have you checked the death rates in Iran and Spain and France and Italy? It's far worse than people are saying. You know, some think this is going to lead to a deep recession, maybe even a depression. And others are saying, no, I think the economy is going to rebound like never before. I mean, you look in the church and there's voices that are saying, this is God's judgment. And the others are saying, no, that's an old covenant mindset. You know, some are saying this is, you know, this is going to, This is trying God awakening the church and others saying this is just the result of evil governments. You know, and so the point is there are so many opinions. There's so much noise. There's so much clutter out there. It's hard, and this is the way I feel, it's hard to really get down to figure out, okay, what is really going on? I mean, what is really happening And what is the Lord saying and what is the Lord doing in this crisis? What is it the Lord is wanting to get and what is the Lord is wanting to speak? And I want to, that's really the area I want to address this today, is what is the Lord speaking in this crisis? You know, and um, my heart in this crisis as a pastor is I really want to seek the Lord And really spend much time in prayer waiting on the Lord to say, Lord, what are you doing and what are you saying in this? That's the the service I can offer you. And I want to, and the best I can in this time, is I really do want to serve you well in that area. And as a leadership team, we want to serve you well in this area. Is that we would truly get the mind of God of what the Lord is speaking and what the Lord is saying. And so... I come from that angle today is after spending much time in prayer before the Lord 
waiting on him. Lord, what are you speaking? What are you saying? As I do want to share what I believe, something, a, a real message the Lord put on my heart for us, for the church, for our church, for what the, and throughout the global body of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to be speaking out of John chapter 6. And so, like I shared on, in my message on March 22nd, I believe this pandemic is a merciful opportunity from God to really show us, to really reveal to us how unprepared we are for what's really coming. The intense pressures are really coming. I know a lot of us are like, oh, Lord, this is hard enough. And the Lord's like, that's nothing compared to what's coming. And I, I believe it's a test run that the Lord is allowing us to go through to show us and to reveal to us how much more and how much more preparation we need for what's really coming. And so, I, I, you know, like I mentioned in that message, it, this is, this is a, a real time for us to make the Lord himself our refuge. You know, we talked about it last time in the last message. Psalms 91 is critical for us, is the Lord himself must become our refuge. Not just even praying Psalms 91, though that's good, and not even quoting Psalm 91, though that is good as well, but making the Lord himself our refuge. It is a person we're taking refuge in. It is a person we're taking refuge in. We're not taking refuge in what we pray or say. We're taking refuge in the man, Jesus Christ. And so it's so important that as we enter this time, that Psalms 91 is becoming crucial for us, but it's, it's not just praying it or quoting it, but it's actually abiding in him, it's, it's having intimacy with the Lord. It's building an ark of his presence. See, a lot of people want to know, okay, what do we want to do? What do we need to do to prepare for what's coming? And how do we handle this current crisis? And the last thing people are turning to in the church is intimacy with Jesus when that should actually be the first thing we turn to. See, the first thing that God is looking for in this season is he's, he's looking for his people to turn into intimacy with him. That's what he's looking for. And so I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Don't let that be the last thing you do, but the first thing you do. Let this be a wake-up call to you. If you haven't, you know, if you've been spending not much time with the Lord, developing an intimate relationship with him, let it be the opportunity for you to get that, that right, Give, of really developing that secret place, intimate, deep, experiential relationship with Jesus Christ. If you've been doing it and you're doing it for 15 minutes, bump it up to 30 minutes. Now, time isn't really what it's all about, but go deeper in the Lord in this season. Go deeper in the Lord. It's so important to take this opportunity and go deeper in him. Because as we develop that ark, that ark of his presence, as we're building an ark like Noah did. Noah built a physical boat that protected him from the judgments that came down upon the heathenistic world. We are building an ark of the presence of Jesus Christ. I believe with all my heart the only protection we have in this season and in the times ahead is going to be Christ Jesus himself. And so it's important that we begin developing that intimate relationship with him in this season. Now, in this message, what I want to do is I want to open up John chapter 6, and I want to reveal to us a pattern that I see in John chapter 6, a pattern that I believe is so relevant for the times we live in, for the season we live in. And in this pattern, what we find is we find that we find four different scenes going on in John chapter 6. And I would also, I would encourage you, spend some time in John chapter 6 meditating on what the Lord is speaking in that, in that beautiful chapter. But we see four different scenes going on. The first scene is we have a crowd of people. There's 5,000 or so men, the scriptures say, 5,000 men. So there's probably, when you factor in women and children, there's probably 10,000 people at a Jesus meeting. Think about that. 10,000 people at a Jesus meeting. 
And the Lord is doing miracles. He's doing signs and wonders. He's offering provision to the people. He's, 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 giving, he's meeting their needs. And they're, they're, they're thinking, this is incredible. This is the Messiah. This is the prophet that Moses talked about. He's here. He's among us. And they wanted to make him king at that moment. And I'm going to get into it in a minute, but... You know, they were basically seeking Jesus for selfish reasons. And I, I'm going to talk about that a little bit in a minute. The second thing is, is we see, not as the crowd is seeking Jesus, we then see a transition. We see the Lord sending out his disciples, sending out the disciples into a boat to cross the lake, to cross the Sea of Galilee, to cross that lake, to go to the other side, in other words, what we see, applying it to us, is we see a people in transition. The people were seeking the Lord for what he could do for them. And the Lord was wanting to transition them from seeking him for selfish reasons to seeking him because of who he is. And that's the transition I believe we are in. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute as well. The third thing we see, the third scene we see, is the Lord inviting the masses into his ultimate intention. And so we don't know exactly from the 10,000 how many crossed over to seek him on the other side of the lake. But if let's just say all of them did, just for the sake of this example, 10,000 people are now hearing the Lord, and his, his entire message changes from one of signs and wonders and provision to where he offers himself as the ultimate intention of God. And I'm going to get into that as well in a minute. But you know what happens? Is the majority of those people, even his disciples said, what you're saying is offensive. What you're saying is just a difficult statement to hear that you want us to live by you, the bread of life. And it says, as a result of this, which leads me to the, the fourth scene, as a result of this, many were no longer walking with the Lord. That's sad to me. And we're going to unpack all that that means in this message. But how sad that the Lord offers himself to people and they turn him down because it didn't fit into their life. And such is the challenge I believe we have before us in this crisis. And so what I want to do now is go through each scene one by one in more detail to help us really hear what the Lord is wanting to say. So scene number one, and you can read it in John chapter 6, the crowds are seeking Jesus and they're doing it selfishly. You know, isn't the church that way right now? Uh, so much of the church, we love when the Lord provides for us. I, I love when the Lord provides for me. Don't mistake what I'm saying. The Lord wants to provide for us. The Lord does heal our sick bodies. The Lord does miracles. The Lord do is our provider. But there's times when the Lord says, okay, you are seeking me because I provided for you. You are seeking me. You're trying to take me and fit me into your life when I want you, I want you to make me the life you live by. See, a lot of us are trying to do that. We're trying to fit the Lord into our life when he wants to become our life. See, we're, we, we love it. We love the Jesus meetings when he blesses. We love the Jesus meetings when signs and wonders are flowing. We love the Jesus meetings when we can sing about him as king and Lord. But what happens when the Lord comes to us and he contradicts what we want for our life and he disrupts our life? Will he still be king and Lord in those moments? That's the challenge. That's the test. That was the challenge this crowd faced. The 10,000 people there, they loved it because they could fit Jesus into their life. They could get the provision. They could get the miracles. They could get the signs. They could get the wonders. But then when the Lord confronted that and said, I want to call you into a deeper relationship with me, and their needs were no longer the central issue 
it created offense. I believe that's what we have going on in the church right now is so much of the church we love and we sing about Jesus and we say Jesus is Lord and we raise up a banner to what the Lord is and all that. But when the Lord says, I want you to do something and it contradicts what we want and it contradicts our will, that's when it really comes down to it. Am I really Lord of your life or only am I only the Lord when it's convenient for you and fits into your plans and agenda? So that's what's going on here in John chapter 6 is we, the, we want to fit the Lord into our box, into our life, into the way we do church, into the way our family does it, and the way all these different things, as long as the Lord does not contradict that, we're good. But when he challenges it, that's when the test really comes. And I, I believe that in this time, this is what I believe the Lord put on my heart to share. That in this time, this crisis is being used by the Lord as a sword of division in his church. The Lord wants to use this crisis. And I understand, I know it's, it's even hard to share that because I understand people have fear and they have anxiety and you know you're wondering how are we going to get our groceries and the last thing I need is to be challenged by the Lord I just need hope but the Lord doesn't really operate on our timetable and on our schedule and on our agenda and so I believe the, the this crisis is being used by the Lord in his church to prune to sift to weed out to to really do a deep work in his church. And I, I hope we can have ears to hear the Lord in this. Now, I want to read a scripture from Luke chapter 2, verse 34. It's talking about Simeon when he saw the Christ child, that Simeon said the child is appointed, talking about Christ, talking about Jesus, this child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. He's going to be a sign to be opposed. A sword will even pierce your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. I believe what we're going to see when this crisis comes to an end, I believe what we're going to see is a sword coming to the church of Jesus Christ. A sword that is going to divide. A sword that is going to bring promotion to some and demotion to others. Those who have been building their own kingdoms, those who have been building their own churches, those who have been building their own ministries, I believe there's coming a demotion. And some are even going to be shut down by the Lord himself. While others who've been in the wilderness of preparation for years, sometimes even decades, and they're wondering, when are we going to get out of this wilderness? When are we going to get out of these trials? The Lord is going to begin to release and to promote those to a place of greater influence because their agendas have been purified by fire. And I believe that John chapter 6 reveals the sword of division the Lord brings to his people to say, are you in this for yourself and what you can get from the Lord, or are you in it for the Lord himself with no ulterior motive? And that's, that's the challenge we face right now. Is now scene number two. After the Lord makes this incredible provision of fish and bread, Jesus sends the disciples ahead of him. Now, Jesus takes a delay here, and he goes up into the mountain to pray, and the disciples are going out into a ship, into a boat to cross the lake. And they're about three or four miles in their journey of crossing over. They're in a time of transition. And in this journey, all of a sudden, a storm rises up and begins to batter their boat and begins to crash against their boat. And the disciples, like you and I would be, just like we, a lot of us are in this current storm we find ourselves in, is they're filled with fear. Now, they had been in another crisis in their boat with the storms and the wind before, and they had seen Jesus rebuke it, but he's not now in the boat. And fear is coming upon them. Fear seizes their heart. 
And then what happens is the Lord himself, be, and you know the story, the Lord himself begins walking on the water, showing them I am the Lord in the storm and I am the Lord over the storm. And I believe that's what God is doing in this hour. He's saying to the church, I am the Lord in the storm, and I am the Lord over the storm. But here's what happened. The disciples looked at this, and they saw this thing approaching them, and, and they don't think it's Jesus. They've never seen him walk on water. They're, I mean, that's not even in their frame of mind. They're looking out. And they can't recognize that it's Jesus in the storm. And so they're looking at it and they're saying, okay, it's a ghost. There's a ghost coming to us. And here's what I want us to get. Here's what I want us to realize. Is, is that they did not recognize Jesus in the storm. See, how many of us in this current crisis are not recognizing what God is doing in this storm? See, some are attributing the work of the Lord to demons, and some are attributing the work of the Lord to evil governments and evil men. Now, please understand, there is a tremendous amount of evil that's at work in this crisis. No doubt about that. I'm not going to get into that in this message, but there is absolutely no doubt about the demonic and the evil intentions that are involved in a storm. But I also want us to say and see that the Lord is using this crisis to do something in his church. Now, like I said on the, the message from March 22nd, I don't believe the Lord released this pandemic. I don't personally believe this is something that was released by the Lord himself, like we see in Revelation chapter 6 when the Lamb breaks the seals and releases the, the, the seal judgments and the bowls and the trumpets and those, those judgments that come directly from Jesus himself, I don't believe this is that at all. I, it's my personal conviction because, I mean, if you, I believe that it's either a biological release from the lab or it happened in the Chinese wet markets, but that's another story. I don't believe the Lord initiated this, but I absolutely believe the Lord is using it. I mean, when you think about it, think about this. In one moment, everything we hold dear has come to an absolute standstill. Sports, restaurants, food, prosperity, entertainment, our beloved forms of doing church. I mean, I'm preaching right now to an empty room. You know, all of, you know, everything we hold dear has come to a halt I believe the Lord is in that as, as a chess master, a wise chess master at the highest level. He's taking the, the, the moves that people make and evil governments make and demons make, and he's taking it and he's maneuvering it with wisdom that is transcendent that no one can even fathom. He's maneuvering that by his wisdom to bring about his ultimate intention. So I believe you know, the, the thing we don't want to do is we don't want to look at this and say, it's, it's only the devil or it's only evil governments or it's only this or it's only that. We want to see what is it the Lord is doing in this storm. Because we want to make the most of this opportunity, don't we? We want to, I don't want us to waste this trial. Let's not waste this trial. You know, some are, are even protesting the fact that the church can't meet, and they're saying the government is taking away our rights to meet. Now, I believe there's coming a time when that happens in America, and at that moment, we will need to disobey the government. But I do not believe this is the time right now. I do not believe that at all. I, you know, people are thinking they're, they're taking away our rights. This is a violation of the Constitution and all that that people are saying. But let me ask you this question. Think about this for a second. What if the Lord himself in the storm has allowed the church to shut down for a season? 
That's almost unthinkable to us, right? I mean, isn't it? I mean, it's almost unthinkable to even ask such a question. Certainly not would the Lord would do that. I mean, we love our church, and we love the external things, and we love our music, and we love our motivational messages, and all that we have. We love all these different things, but what if the Lord has come for the, uh, a season to shut down the church to get us back to the foundation of himself? Don't get offended at that, please. Just think about it. Think about it. What if it's, what if it's the Lord using governments in this situation to put an end to the church as we have known it so we can get back to the very foundation of what church really is, and that's the person of Jesus Christ, developing an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. So think about that for a second. For years, and I just consider it an incredible honor to be able to have heard Terry Bennett for years. For years, Terry Bennett has been saying this, sharing about a prophetic encounter he had. I don't even know. It was many years back where he watched the Lord take a hammer to the church, and it was to, it, to a church, but it was representative of the entire church. He took the Lord himself, took a hammer, and demolished the church until the church was brought down to its very foundations. I'm telling you, I've been hearing that for years. I, I didn't know how that was going to be fulfilled. I didn't know if that meant the Lord was just going to call a remnant out or what. I had no idea that a pandemic was going to hit and that we would be forced into a place where church could not meet. I say the Lord is in that. And he wants to get at something. He wants to speak at something to say to us, We've got to come out of our old wineskins into the new wineskin for the new wine for what the Lord wants to do. I believe, I believe with all my heart there will be a, a significant remnant that are, going to, that are going to hear the Lord in that. And they're going to respond to what the Lord is doing and what the Lord is saying in that. But I also believe that a lot of people love their external ways of doing church. We love our music. We love our message. We love our buildings. We love our meetings and all that, that, that church has come to mean. And when this season comes to an end, they're going to do exactly what Isaiah said. We're going to rebuild it. We're going to rebuild it with smooth stones. We're going to make it so much better than ever before. And we're going to miss the intention of the Lord in this season of a divine reset. Let's not do that. I'm just, I'm urging us, let's not do that. Let's not miss what the Lord is doing in this season. And let me say one other thing about the prophetic. Is there's a lot of talk out there of like, is this word going to come to pass? Is that word going to come to pass? And there is, rightfully so, a lot of criticism of the prophetic. There needs to be. We're, we're called to judge. We're called to test prophetic words. We're called to assess prophetic words. But I also think it's very important when, when a prophetic man or woman of God prophesies something and it comes to pass, we, like, we also need to look at it and say, okay, this has come to pass, this has weight and authority in it. And what Terry has been speaking for years, that God is, is destroying the external to get us back to the internal, leading to a holy of holies relationship with the person of Jesus Christ, this, that word has incredible amount of authority in it now. When this prophetic word has been stated years in advance and been fulfilled, and so... There's so many people out there. What is God saying? What is God saying? I always look at and say, okay, what did the Lord say five years ago, ten years ago, and what has come to pass? That is what has authority in it. And so the Lord is coming in the midst of the storm. He's walking on the water. Let's not look at the Lord and coming in a way that contradicts our theological box, contradicts what we think the Lord wants, and call it a ghost. Let's see the Lord in the storm, what the Lord is doing, what the Lord is wanting to bring, a divine reset 
that brings the church back to the person of Jesus Christ. Not doctrines about him, not singing about him, but having this intimate relationship with him as life, as the bread of life. And so I hope, I just really pray the church can get back to Christ. Can we can come back to the person of Jesus Christ. We can see, okay, this is really what's happening. And so here we have in this transition is we have the Lord coming, transitioning the church from seeking the Lord selfishly, Signs, we want our signs, we want our wonders, we want our miracles, we want our provision. That's what we come to church for. The Lord crossing over to the other side. And now we get to, to uh, scene number three, the call to return to the person. And Jesus gives probably one of, most likely one of his most challenging messages in Scripture. And it goes, this, this, is, so, this is what's sobering to me. It goes from 10,000 people hearing his message, seeking the signs and the wonders, reduced down. It says, we don't know the exact number, but it, it seems like it was only 12 afterwards, the 12 that were following with him. It was probably more than that. But the winnowing, the winnowing pruning, sifting hand of God comes down and winnows the church and so we want to look at, okay, what was it the Lord was speaking? What was it the Lord was saying in this? And I believe you could summarize it this way, is that we would no longer try to fit Jesus into our lives, but we would make him our life. Leonard Ravenhill said, we've got people who've been saved for 30 years. And they're not a day older in the spiritual life. They're no more mature. They're no more spiritual strength or spiritual understanding or spiritual revelation. Why? Because they've lived on meetings instead of living on Christ. I think he nails it. That is, that is spot on is so much of the church has become addicted to meetings, addicted to conferences, addicted to events, addicted to services, addicted to signs and wonders, addicted to the gifts of the Holy Spirit, addicted to great worship, addicted to all the music and all that's going on. And you look at them, and they're still in the same level of maturity they were in five years ago. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago. Because they have not learned to partake of the person, Jesus Christ. That's probably my number one burden as a pastor. You know, as a pastor, the, the, the thing, the, the most I can do as a pastor is be like a waiter who comes up reads the menu, talks about what we have to offer, but I can't feed you and I can't make you eat. At some point, you've got to take the message that has been given and you've got to go to the Lord himself to eat. And you, you know, every pastor has heard it before. I'm just not growing anymore here. I'm just not getting anymore here. You know, I just need to go somewhere where I'm going to be fed. Well, let me tell you this. That's never been God's intention. You are to go to the Lord himself to be fed. No pastor is to be one who is feeding you. That's what you do to babies. You feed babies by a spoon. You spoon feed babies, not to the mature. So you need to learn to come to the Lord himself. I believe the Lord has come in this season, in this divine reset. He's pushed pause on our church meetings to, to really cry to the remnant, to hopefully whoever would hear, come back to the person of Jesus Christ. C. 
See, in this transitional time, the Lord is calling us back to himself. Now, as I look through John chapter 6, I see several key phrases the Lord is, is saying to us. They're beautiful. I mean, this is what, um, what amazes me is that people, would, the people got offended at what Jesus was saying. When you really understood what he was saying, he was talking about having the uncreated divine life of the Son of God placed inside of you. And so we see here that he says, he uses the words believe, receive, and, and the concept of rest. And he, over several times he says, come to me. Eat and drink of him, behold him, abide in him and him in us, live by his life. How beautiful. See, I think what so many in the church are doing in this crisis right now is they're still living by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They're searching the internet and they're digging for information. They're trying to find out what's really going on and they're seeing the conspiracies and there's a lot of conspiracies going on. Some are theories, some are real. They're digging deep into that to try to get, okay, what's happening? They're trying to get information. They're trying to get facts. They're trying to get data. Now, I'm doing that as well, okay? So it's not a bad thing to do it. But what we do, we got to be very careful that we don't get the information so that then we can live independently of Jesus himself. What the Lord would rather us do in this time is not live by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, accumulating information so that we still live. So that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but that we would come to the person of Jesus Christ. We would come to the tree of life. We would come to what Jesus reveals himself as the bread of life, and we would learn how to eat of him. And we would learn how to drink of him. We would learn how to partake of him. We would learn what it means to fellowship with Jesus. It's a beautiful message the Lord's offering. And so in John 6, 28, some of the people said, okay, what do we need to do to do the works of God? What do we need to do to do the works of God? That's just always been the cry of God's people. We want to do the work. We want to go out and do something for God. We want to go out and build something for God. We want to go construct something for the Lord. The Lord does not need us to build anything for him. And Jesus answered them and he said, This is the work of God, that you believe in him, who the Lord, the Father has sent. We want to go work, we want to go do, and the Lord is calling us to believe. See, there is a divine rest that God is offering his people in the season. There is a Sabbath rest the Lord is offering in the season. And he's saying to, the, to his church, come to me. Come to me and eat. See, ask yourself this question. Has this crisis caused me to go deeper in my relationship with him? See, I, I fear that we have not recognized the hand of the Lord in this storm putting an end to church as we know it for a season to say, this it is not about meetings. I'm not against meetings. It's not about gathering. It's not about buildings. I mean, but you need buildings and you need meetings. Obviously, I'm not saying don't ever do it. But the essence of it is that a people would come to Jesus individually to know him for themselves. And getting that thing right, then we come together corporately to express his indwelling life together. So ask yourself, evaluate your life. Has, have you gone deeper in the Lord during this crisis, or are you still the same place you were in three weeks ago, a month ago? Has this crisis awakened you to seek the Lord, to buy oil for your lamp, to press in to know the Lord like never before, or are you still doing what you have been doing? See, the Lord is beckoning to us. He's calling us. He's inviting us deeper into a relationship with him. It's beautiful. The work of God, the eternal work of God, 
The ultimate intention of God is that we would have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is what this whole thing is about. It's to know him, to have a relationship with him. To live by his life, to, to come to him as the bread of life. See, what is God doing? It's what he has been doing before the creation of the world. It's what his ultimate intention is all about. It is about bringing his son to the forefront of all things. That Jesus Christ would have the preeminence in his house, in the world, in the nations, and that his life would fill a people and they would be filled with his life, becoming his very own bride, his wife, being conformed into his image and becoming mature sons of God. That is what God is always doing. That is what God is going to be doing here at the end of the age. That is his ultimate intention. The work of God has always been the person of Jesus Christ. Not just believing in him, like you go down the aisle and say, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. I mean a living 24 hours, seven day a week, believing in him as the source of your everything. That's what the Lord's getting at. And so the Lord comes to the, to the masses. The Lord comes to the masses and he says, he challenges them, don't work for the food that perishes. Come to the bread of life. Here, here is the tree of life. Think about this. The tree of life has come back onto the scene for the first time since Genesis chapter 2, chapter 3. The tree of life himself embodied in the person of Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God, the tree of life, now saying, I am the tree of life. I am the bread of life. If you eat of me and drink of me, you will have life in you. See, the masses still, they just wanted to fit Jesus into their life. They still wanted a miracle. They still wanted provision. They still were selfishly seeking Jesus instead of coming to him as the life they live by. And so in John 6, 57, the Lord summarizes really everything. I love this scripture. It's incredible. As the living Father sent me, and my translation says, I, and I live by, because of the Father. I think the better translation is by the Father. I'm going to say it that way. As the living Father sent me, and I live by the Father, so he who eats me will live by me. Oh, what incredible words. The bread of life incarnate. Saying to the masses, don't just seek me because of provision. Don't just seek me because of miracles. Don't seek me just what I can do for you. Come to me to have a personal, deep, experiential relationship with me. Partake of me as the bread of life. Eat of me. And as you eat of me, you will begin to live by me. So one of the things I've been doing in my time with the Lord like that, that's really been, I'm like, why didn't I learn this earlier? It's so simple. It's so easy. I mean, I, hopefully this can save you many, many years of, of missing the Lord. This is so easy. When I, I'm, I used to come to the Lord and I would first open up the Bible or I would open up a book or I would immediately start praying my prayer list. But now I realize before I do any of those things, I'll have my Bible with me. I have the notebook with me to pray. I have music sometimes. Before I do any of that, I say, Lord, I'm coming to you, a person. And I'm not looking to heaven. I'm looking inwardly to him where he dwells. And I'm, I'm waiting on him in my spirit. Just for him, almost, this is the way I envision it, him extending his hand to me saying, come away with me, my beloved. And I go inward to where he is. 
And then I, I sense, okay, Lord, what are you doing? What are you saying? What are you speaking? And as I begin to write down what I'm sensing the Lord saying, what I'm sensing the Lord speaking, it is the most incredible relationship. You can have that every day. The Lord wants to speak to you way more than you want to hear from. The problem is we don't, we're doing it wrong, right? So we're doing it wrong. We're trying to find him in the Bible. Now, I'm totally for reading the Bible. You know that. But the Lord told the Pharisees, he said, you search the scriptures because you think in the scriptures there's life. But you're unwilling to come to me. That's the key right there. Come to him. See what I'm saying? Is the Lord is calling us to come to Him, to go deep internally to where He dwells and to have the fellowship for what you were created for. I want to encourage you with everything I've got in this season. You know, everything's going frantic and all the anxiety and what's going to happen and where is this all leading? You know, no one knows but God himself where finally this is leading to. But I want to say one thing we can know for certain is what the Lord told Mary. He said, this one thing will not be taken away from you. It doesn't matter what happens in the nations. You can have intimacy with the Lord right now. That's what he's calling to the church too, to move away from our, our, our addiction to meetings, events, signs and wonders and provision. Now we need all of that. But to make the ultimate thing developing a deep, personal, intimate, experiential relationship with Jesus Christ by the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now finally here, scene four is the sifting the Lord is, I, I just have seen it over and over. The Lord, when he offers an invitation, and he's patient, he's, he's very patient. But when we refuse the invitation over and over and over, there comes a time when a sifting takes place. I've seen it. It's sad. It breaks my heart. People who you love, people that you've been friends with, just walk away. And so here we see in John chapter 6 that the Lord confronts a people of, who want to fit Jesus into their life, but he says, no, I'm calling, you to, I'm calling you, come to me so I can be your life. And he comes to them, and, and so you see that what happens in verse 60, John 60 and 61, you, you know the story, but it says, many of his disciples... When they heard the Lord's message about coming to him as life, coming to him as the bread of life, partaking of him, eating of him as the life they live by, they said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus was aware of it. And it was not just the church hoppers. It was not just the masses. It was actually his disciples. That's what convicts me. That's what makes me go, dear God, let me not be one who falls away when you speak. And he turned at them and he said, does this offend you? Does this offend you? We have to be so careful in this season we're in. Not to be offended at the Lord. When describing the end of the age, the Lord said, many will be offended. Now, there's going to be a lot of reasons why we're offended, but the, one of the reasons people are going to be offended is we don't like that Jesus has come to disrupt and interrupt our lives. The Lord said, blessed is he who is not offended at me. I, it's getting really quiet in here. No, I'm just kidding. There's no one here. But I can feel the quietness out on your TVs, your iPads, or wherever you're watching this. Don't be offended at the Lord. <clears throat> Don't be offended. And just think about this. What has been disrupted 
in your life. You know, all of us have, have experienced disruption in one form or another in this crisis. Don't let the offense come where you question God. See, what happened at the end <clears throat> is the majority of the people walked away. And here's what it says. Notice this in John now, I want you to notice this. John chapter 6, verse 66. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew. They shrank back. They weren't following him anymore. And it says they were not walking with him anymore. I, personally, I don't think it's divine. I don't think it's just coincidence that God sovereignly watching over the scriptures, being put into a canon, that we get to John 666, really laying for us the, the absolute definition of the Antichrist agenda. Really, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil goes back to all of that. The ultimate Antichrist agenda is to get us offended at Jesus Christ and then replace him, replace Christ with something or someone else. As the Lord sifts and prunes and tests his church in this crisis, I just want to encourage you with all my heart, don't get offended. Don't get offended at him. He's under the impression he's God because he is. He's Lord. He can do whatever he pleases. Who are we to talk back to God? What right does the clay have to say to the potter? Who are we to complain to him and grumble at him and what he does? I'm telling you from experience, if you will not allow offense to get into your heart, at the disruptions the Lord has created in your life in this situation. I mean, it is a, right now, life is really a pain. I mean, you, you go to the grocery store and you have to get, when you get home, you have to spend an hour sanitizing what you brought in. You go to the gas pump and you have to basically wear a hazmat suit. I mean, life as we know it has been interfered with and disrupted. You know, I, all of us are looking back and going, man, I wish I can't wait to go eat at a restaurant. I can't wait to go see a movie. I can't wait to go watch a football game. You know, all of us, me included, we're all thinking that way. Don't let the disruption that has come allow you to become offended at God. And don't allow the disruption that has come cause you to miss what God is doing and saying. This is an incredible gracious, merciful opportunity the Father has given you to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push pause here for a minute. I'm going to initiate a divine reset that's going to get you back to the person of Jesus Christ. And yet, only a remnant likely will respond. And I'm saying that from scriptures and I'm saying it from experience. I want to encourage you be part of that remnant that says yes to the Lord. Amen. Amen.